Okay, so now let's start recording. Uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, the triaxial test and the homework which is due uh, this week. The first thing I wanted to do is a little bit of theory, but also it's related to directly to your homework. And it is about drawing a more circle and what it and it's also related to really what a, a more circle is in general. So let me zoom up. Okay. So as part of the homework, you have to draw more circles. And as far as I know, Excel cannot draw circles uh, given a center and a diameter. So you have to do that. And a more circle if this is always uh, x-axis is going to be normal stress uh, shear stress is going to be in the y-axis uh, we always draw just half of the circle because the other half is basically the same and maximum principal stress is going to be on the right minimum principal stress is going to be on the left and we are going to have here this amount which is the center and this other amount which is going to be the radius of the circle okay so uh, <coughs> basically every point in the circle it's a pair of values sigma a in the x-axis tau in the y-axis how can I calculate sigma n and tau as a function of r and an angle that now I'm gonna call 2 beta you will see why I call it 2 beta in a, in a bit this is just trigonometry sigma 1 uh, and let, let me let me delete that uh, actually I want to start with sigma n sigma n in <coughs> in any position around the circle is going to be equal to uh, let's imagine that just for now that at the point I'm looking for is somewhere over here okay and the angle 2 beta goes from here to there so if I wanted to know what is the value of sigma n it's going to be this distance c plus the radius times the cosine of the angle so for example when the angle is uh, 0 then c plus what is cosine of 0? One. 1 so c plus r gives you sigma 1 mm -hmm. when 2 beta is uh, 180 degrees this goes all the way over here and cosine of 180 is negative, negative one. 1 so c minus r gives you sigma 3 and when 2 beta is in between 0 and 180 degrees it gives you a point somewhere around the circle that's for sigma n and shear stress tau is just going to be r times the sine of 2 beta for example in this case if 2 beta is from here to there the sine is just going to give you this amount so this is going to be r times sine of 2 beta and that's it that's everything you have to do in order to draw the more circle what you're going to have to do either in uh, MATLAB Python or Excel is just to tell the computer to explore a linear space from 0 to 180 degrees and get as many points as you want probably with 10 is going to be enough and you plot the series of points and then you will get the circle I'm gonna I'm gonna do it in in a sec. 
uh, in Excel on the computer. But before we go there, there is something very important ab about this angle two beta. Because in physical terms, this angle also has meaning. If you remember from the previous lecture, we saw that if we have a rock that is subjected to axial stress, sigma 1, and radial stress, sigma 3, <coughs> then an angle 2 beta equal to 0, it means that it will be on sigma 1, that's beta equal to 0, and an angle 2 beta equal to 180 degrees is going to be that line. And beta, in this case, is going to be an angle that goes from it's going to go from that point or from this phase towards that point or towards that phase and in reality remember that the angle is always half of the one of the more circle <coughs> or in the more circle the angle is two times the one that you have in reality. So let's say that beta is 45 degrees in the actual sample. Where is that in the Mohr circle? 90. <coughs> 90. It's a point over there. It's a point of the maximum shear stress, but not necessarily the one of the maximum shear to normal stress, which is going to cause failure in rocks. So by moving this angle everywhere beta equal to 0 to 90, you can calculate what is the normal stress and what is the shear stress at any angle in this solid. Remember that here, uh, at any plane, at an arbitrary plane, we're going to have a normal stress and a shear stress. And those two values depend on what that angle is. If this angle is zero, shear stress is zero and sigma n is sigma one. If this angle is 90 degrees, now sigma n is equal to sigma three and tau is equal to zero, which are those two points over there. Okay, so let's do that quickly in the Okay, I hope that software is still working because I cannot see any more. Uh, but uh, let me open Excel and I want to check. How is the homework going so far? You guys are halfway, almost done. The second problem, it, it brings something back from uh, <coughs> the, the part of elasticity. So, okay, this is recording. Uh, so you're gonna have to compute the YAM modules over there and uh, also a Poisson ratio, but this time it's from a triaxial test under confinement. Uh, all right, uh, let's look at the first problem. Uh, can you tell me what was sigma one for the first data point? Ten point five. Ten point five. Twenty seven point five. Twenty seven point five. Oh no, like those are just sigma one. Okay, so it's, it's going to be this one plus twenty seven point five, right? Okay. So if I want to compute sigma n and tau, uh, I'm going to create here uh, an angle beta that is going to go from 0 to. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. This one? Sigma 3, how much? 3.4. Yeah. Mm, <coughs> no, no, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's not possible. That's cool. let, let, me, let me check that. So, oh, 3.4, that one. So the first one is, is 3.4. Okay, 3.4. Oh, okay, okay, okay. 3.4, I got it now. 10.5, right? Yes. Sigma 1 or deviatory? That's sigma 1. Okay. Uh, all right. So I'm going to make my angles here go all the way to 180. Well, actually, to 90. And we're saying that sigma n is going to be equal to the center, which is sigma 3 plus sigma 1 divided by 2 plus the radius, which is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2 times the cosine of the angle right so this is the angle and I have to multiply this times pi divided 180 and I need to lock these ones and that's going to be the value so the first one 10.5, the last one should be uh, 3.4. So what went wrong over here? You guys see what, what went wrong over there? Did you multiply the angle by two? Do I have to multiply the beta by two? Oh. That's what I forgot. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. That's what you get. And then we'll do the same for tau. So, tau is just going to be the radius. And uh, now this is going to be sine. And this one is going to be A. And tau should be zero there, and should be zero over there. This practically is zero. And now we can plot these two as a line, as a scatter plot. I'm going to use here the curves, so it looks a little bit nicer. And there you go. You have your more circle. Something very important here, guys, is that this, this one doesn't look like a <coughs> circle, right? And it doesn't look like a circle because my axes are not really proportional. I know that in MATLAB you can fix this uh, very quickly by, by doing uh, square axes and uh, just tell MATLAB to do that and he'll do it. I, I don't know in Excel how to do that. Right click the uh, Y axis. Right click the Y axis. Say format axis. Okay. Go to number in the second tab. That's right. No, that's the second tab. Yeah. And then for the fixed, you need to do Oh, okay. Yeah, I know how to do that, but I wanted to make them square to have exactly the same length. Oh, then you just type in 12 for the Y and just the X. That's what I Well, 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 yeah, I know. I know that too, but. Okay, I could do that, right? But. Uh, but it's not going to be ex exact, yeah. you know, circle. So probably, you know, to me it looks like this one should be six in order to to be more or less square. And there you go. There you have uh, your circle. Uh, no, cancel. So, so that's what you have to do for the circle, okay? I don't care if it's perfectly circle or not. 
probably you may want to do a few more points so it looks a little bit nicer. But uh, but that's that's it. That's how you draw the the circle in in Excel or in MATLAB. Okay, so let's talk about problem number three. Uh, problem number two, I was telling you, it's uh, it's you have to measure yam moduli and you have to measure the, the strength of the rock, but there's nothing different to what you have already seen before. <coughs> uh, there is one more thing that probably it's uh, worth to notice, and it is that you have to cal calculate volumetric strain. And let me just say that very quickly. When you run these triaxial tests, And usually it's a function of time. You increase your confinement up to, up to a certain point at which you get your confining stresses that are relevant to the particular place that you're interested in. And at the same time, when you do that, you also increase sigma 1 and then you start to increase uh, sigma 1 and probably let me let me make it a little bit more realistic this is what is going to happen with sigma 1 and the difference between these two is the deviatoric stress and usually these uh, tests are run at what is called a constant strain rate, which means exactly as you do in the machine downstairs, you fix a velocity, say 0 0.02 inches per minute, and you increase the load at that rate until the rock <coughs> fails. If you process this data, and you plot strains as a function of the deviatoric stress. Deviatoric stress notice starts at zero. Uh, you will see that uh, let me you will see that your axial strain the sample is go always going to get shorter in one direction and then we'll go through a peak the sample is going to start to expand in the other direction and that's going to give you the Poisson ratio uh, okay so let me fix this let me check if the recording software is still working if it is hmm okay wait a minute I knew I had to bring my GoPro today but you know somehow I, I said well I think it's gonna work fine but apparently it lost the connection okay um, let me see let me try again Okay, so I know I know what I can do. We'll just give it some time, and in the meantime, I'm gonna come back over here 
and Okay, I'll come back to this point later on, but uh, I'm going to show you uh, quickly here in the dog camera. And uh, basically, uh, you will see here, uh, this is going to be, this is a mistake. This is epsilon 1. This is epsilon 3, or the radial strain. And in that problem, you're going to see that you can calculate a volumetric strain and it looks something like this where the volumetric strain in this case is going to be the summation of all the strains and that's why there is a number two over here because e2 and e3 are the same and what what this means is that when the rock you start compressing the rock it shrinks and that's how why you have a, a contraction but there is a point in which it's going to start to dilate. And that dilation shows a point in which the rock starts to break and the fracture starts to open so that if in order for the fracture to open, the uh, sample has to get uh, bigger in size. And, and you're going to see that very clearly in the data in the problem. All right. So, yes. Uh, so let me come back over here. Uh, this is strain rate. The dot means variation of strain with time. Okay? It's a constant. Yeah, CST means means a constant. Okay. Let's see this now, it's not working. Okay. Okay, problem number three. Uh, let me open it actually in another tab. Problem number three. You have data related to a triaxial test in which you have confining pressure that's the pressure that goes outside the membrane of the rock, pore pressure that is inside, and peak deviatoric stress at failure. You have to use all this table in order to compute sigma one and sigma three, then plot sigma one as a function of sigma three, and you will be able to compute what is the shear strength of the rock. And this problem number three is very, very similar to a solved problem in the notes that also goes by 4-3. So let's see what this problem is about. In this problem, you have to fit the line to the data shown in figure 414, which I'm going to show in a bit, for a sandstone, and cal calculate UCS, Q, S0, and friction angle and friction coefficient. This figure is that figure. And uh, the same as in the other problem you have, you know what is the confining pressure, which in this case is S3. You know what is the pore pressure, and you know what was the maximum principal stress of failure. You use all this data, S1, S3, and PP, in order to compute the effective stress is sigma one and sigma three, and is simply S1 minus PP, S3 minus PP, and you should see for the other data that almost all the points, they line up <coughs> on a single line. That line is a failure line. And in this case, this is that red line that you see uh, over here. Uh, in this particular problem, and I also requested this in exams before. I'm not asking you to do curve fitting uh, in the exam, right? But if you look at the data, you know, more or less you can eyeball, eyeball it, you just can trace a line. And in this particular example, I, 
I didn't consider this one because um, I just wanted to get the straight line. So this straight line is just valid for the data around here. Not for this one, but it's valid for that one. What can you get from this line? First of all, the easiest number is going to be UCS. UCS is the intercept of this line with this sigma one axis. And in this case is how much? 90, 80, so, so. And the second thing that you can get is the parameter Q, which is just a slope of that line. And the slope of this line, uh, if I were to compute it, uh, basically you can see that these lines goes from zero to, um, what is that, 110 in the x-axis, okay? And let me write that, 110. And it goes in the y-axis from, let's say, 80 to 600, right? So 520. 520 divided by 110, that's going to be your Q parameter. And in this case, uh, that's going to be about a little bit less than five. And once you get UCS and you get Q, uh, you can you can use yeah, we have UCS we have Q in this case 4.73 you use the equations I'm going to give you in the exam but you, know, you need to know how to use them and you ca can calculate cohesive strength friction angle and friction coefficient so that problem is as simple as that but you need to understand how to uh, process the data in order to compute these two parameters. Okay, um, let's talk about the following topic. I, I, I think with this, I'm, I'm done with the homework. We can discuss a little bit more if you cannot solve it on Wednesday, but uh, do you have any questions right now about the homework? Yes. Uh, it's about the exam. Yes. Are all of the first four chapters on the exam, or are we <coughs> everything? Everything is going to be there. Right. So, so today, in the 15 minutes that we have, I'll try to finish the part of uh, sheer strength and as much as I can of the the next thing, and that's it. Okay. All right. So, I cannot use the dog camera, so we're gonna talk about the next topic. So this is done, which is, uh, well before that, uh, I wanna talk about strength and isotropy. You remember that we talked that, th we said that there is a elastic anisotropy. An elastic anisotropy means that the Young modulus depends on the direction in which you measure the strength uh, or the stiffness of the rocks. For strength and isotropy, it means that the strength of the rock also depends on the angle at which you measure uh, that strength. And in this case, uh, it's something very important for sedimentary rocks because usually <coughs> in real formations, because of the process of sedimentation, we always have rocks that are uh, laminated and they have layers with different properties. And if imagine if you were to drill a wellbore through this rock, the actions that you're putting on the rock is not going to be the same if, if you find this rock over here 
or if you find it at an angle or if you find it somewhere over there usually it's not not always uh, exactly the same but if you were to run a triaxial test uh, rocks uh, would tend to be the stronger what do you think in which direction <coughs> let's say this one this two and this three which one is going to be the stronger do you think we're compressing the rock in this direction let's say for this example <coughs> well let, let's say which one is going to be the weakest and that that's the important thing here number one number two or number three why number two Well, no, no, let's say this, this is very deep and, and the, let's say, you know, this is a thousand feet and from here to there is just a hundred feet. So not, not, not a lot of difference. So let me save some s suspense here. I'm going to tell you right away that the weakest <laughs> is going to be very likely number two. Why? A according to this action over here and to what I'm going to draw over here, whenever you have lamination planes at an angle, and if those lamination planes coincide with the planes of maximum shear to normal stress that's and if those lamination planes are also weak that's going to result in these shear fractures which go mostly into the planes of lamination uh, so if these are already weak interfaces, your rock is going to be weak because of the interfaces, not because of the rock itself. On the contrary, if you had a rock in which the laminations and the weak planes are oriented into this direction in comparison to the load, the fracture is going to have to go through the intact rock and probably at <coughs> some point it may deviate a little bit from there but it's going to have to cut through the strong rock in order to break it and something more or less similar is going to happen with number so this one was number one and in number three uh, let me make number three over here number three if I have lamination planes in this direction uh, when I load it also the shear fracture is going to have to some points it may go through weak planes but some point it has to cut through those planes in order to uh, to continue and I have some very nice images of these that uh, I'm going to try to find and show you next time on, on, on Wednesday that actually uh, show what, what I'm telling you. But uh, we, unfortunately, we do not have time to go into this a lot further. But remember that the strength of the rock is going to depend on the direction. And it's not the same. Uh, you can have the same rock, but the stability of the well is not going to be the same if it's vertical, if it's deviated or if it is horizontal that's going to engage the rock in different directions and the strength of the rock is going to be different 
depending on the direction of the action. OK, so I'm going to upload that page for students that are in here uh, on, the <coughs> on the website. And so you're going to be able to see what I, I drew. Uh, next topic is the last type of failure that uh, we have explored so far. So you remember, we have seen tensile strength, which means that the rock fails with tension. We have seen shear strength, in which the rock fails in shear. And that happens always at the plane of maximum ratio of shear stress to normal stress. And the last one that we're going to see is compression failure. In compression failure, usually uh, we do not develop uh, clear fractures, but rather the rock fails in compression because the normal stresses are so high that at some point you start to crash the grains in the rock and what it was porosity before now gets occupied by crash grains. Um, your permeability, your porosity is going to be much lower, and your permeability is going to be much lower too. Can you think of an example of where we have this type of compression failure? Why would, would we cause this type of compression failure in? in reservoirs. Uh, sorry, say again? Remember that we were talking about depletion. We said when we lower the pressure, effective stress increase. And if they increase beyond an elastic point, they are going to cause significant compaction. And that significant compaction is going to result <coughs> from or collapse. The equations that we saw in order to compute compressibility were restricted to, to elasticity. And this process is not elastic. This process is plastic. Uh, for example, in this plot, you can see that stress is increasing on the x-axis. And here you have the formation. There is a period in which you can load the rock, and if you were to unload it, probably will come back more or less to the same position. So that will be elastic strain. But if you load it above a certain limit, you will gonna, you're going to start to crush the grains, and you're going to have a lot of strain, a lot of compaction, a lot of loss of porosity that is not recoverable. So if you were to unload it, you will come back to this point, but already you will have a 10% strain <coughs> that will cause uh, a significant reduction uh, in porosity. So um, I'm not going to ask you a lot more about this than knowing that there is a compression failure too. So there are two types, tensile, shear, and compression. And we can put those three types. Uh, let me see if it's next. Yes. You, we can summarize these three types into this uh, space of normal stress and shear stress. So let me tell you what's going on over here. What this is basically telling you is that you can start from some in situ stresses, which usually is going to be a more circle uh, let's say somewhere over here. If you do hydraulic fracturing, if you do reservoir depletion, if you do drilling, you're going to change those conditions of normal stress and shear stress. We're going to see later on when we get into applications how that happens. But the important thing to understand here is that the state of stress, in this case represented <laughs> by a Mohr circle, is bound by all these limits. If you increase too much the shear stress, your rock is going to fail in shear. If you increase too much the tensile stresses, or if you decrease the normal stresses, you're going to have tensile failure. 
if you increase too much the compression stresses and you may not increase the shear but you increase too much the compression you're going to run into compression failure and you need to understand all of these lines we saw an equation for this line it's very simple uh, the minimum a uh, principal stress has to reach the tensile strength we saw an equation for the shear uh, strength in which the state of stress has to meet this line in order to have failure and for this one the equation is a little bit more complicated but there is, there is also an equation for that but I want you to remember that if you increase too much the compression stresses also you're going to have failure <coughs> and sometimes if you just have let's say isotropic compression from all directions usually you can get to a higher compression but if you have some shear like somewhere over here you get to that compression failure a, li a little bit sooner than if you had uh, pure compression um, okay so I'm gonna pick it up from here on Wednesday guys uh, try to solve the homework uh, try to work on the on the exams uh, problems because if you have some questions that's going to be the right time to to answer those uh, questions okay see you on Wednesday